Microbes are organisms that really are just too small to see with the naked eye. So typically they require the use of a microscope or some other device to actually view them. There's a lot of diversity when we talk about microbes and they do include prokaryotic organisms and also eukaryotic organisms. Here we're going to talk about the eukaryotes in microbiology and eukaryotes we're going to include um, protist which will be a very broad category. We'll have some fungi and then there's also going to be some animals that are included here as well. The one that we're actually seeing on this slide would be considered an animal but it is going to be pretty small. Now if we talk about the protist first, um, the protist these are going to be very diverse. They are the most diverse of all the eukaryotes and they're just really microscopic eukaryotes. As far as what groups they include, there will be some that are going to be very animal-like. Um, so these will be called protozoans and one of the reasons why we consider them to be very animal-like is because they're going to be heterotrophic um, for the most part and they're also going to be very mobile. We also have some that are more plant-like and we tend to refer to these as algae plant-like because they do have cell walls that are typically very similar to what you find around plant cells. And then they're also going to be um, autotrophic. And then the third group is going to be the water molds, which will be very fungal-like. So we do have um, several different groups, smaller groups of protists that we're going to discuss. Now, first off, if we just look at the organization of the protist, protists are considered polyphyletic. And what that means is that there's not just one common ancestor that gave rise to all the different protists. Protists are actually scattered all over the evolutionary tree. Some of them are more closely related to animals. Some of them are more closely related to fungi or to plants. And if we look at just the eukaryotes in general, this is um, the way that we typically categorize them. At least this is the most commonly accepted scheme today. And that is that we group them into six supergroups and every single one of these supergroups does contain protists within it. So the protists are not all going to be similar to each other by any means. And that's why we say they're a very diverse group. If we talk about the cellular organization of protists, they are eukaryotes. So knowing that they are eukaryotes, they are going to have a lot of organelles, or in other words, their interior is going to be subdivided by different membranes. So just to list some of the different organelles that we would have inside our protist, um, the nucleus is certainly going to be there. The nucleus is going to be for holding the genetic information, and by genetic information, we're really talking about DNA. Since it is a eukaryotic organism, it is going to be linear chromosomes. And not just linear chromosomes, but there will be lots of them. So those linear chromosomes are going to be held inside the nucleus. They will be organized with special proteins called histones. Another thing that we're going to have is typically there will be um, mitochondria or chloroplast. The mitochondria and the chloroplast um, these are unique organelles because they are thought to have arisen um, due to endosymbiosis and both of these have to do with energy production. So they'll both play roles in that, although the roles that they actually play are going to be a little bit different because the mitochondria is producing energy by cellular respiration and the chloroplast is going to use a different process to do that, specifically photosynthesis. Um, we will have an endomembrane system. We could list that here. The endomembrane system includes a lot of other um, compartments or components. And so just to list some of those, we could include the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, vacuoles. All of those are going to be components of the endomembrane system. And besides these, we would have kind of the generic cellular components such as the ribosomes, a cytoskeleton, plasma membrane, cytoplasm. All of those things will be present in these eukaryotic cells. So if we now talk about just, you know, why do we group all of these together and call them protist? Well, protist is, is kind of a generic category um, where we put a lot of different eukaryotes that we can't specifically classify as plants or animals or fungi. So first off, it's important to understand that our protists are going to be very nutritionally diverse. What we mean by that is pretty much anything goes here. We have some protists that are going to be photoautotrophs. 
So this means that they will be autotrophic, able to make their own food, and they'll be able to do that with light. So that's where the photo part comes from. We do have some that are going to be heterotrophic. Heterotrophic means that they have to obtain their nutrients or nutrition from other organisms. So that would be by eating or consuming other organisms, dead or living. And then we have some that are gonna be mixotrophs. Mixotrophs refers to the fact that they can kind of go either way. So sometimes they might be autotrophic, other times they might be heterotrophic. We also have many protists and really most protists that are gonna be modal. So this means that the entire cells will be able to move. Um, they do this with a number of different um, types of appendages or structures. Flagella are more tail-like and we can see the flagella right here. The flagella, you might have one or just a couple of those, and so they kind of just you know, move around. They provide a very um, fast directional movement. We can have things called cilia. The cilia are down here, and they are more like tiny hairs. So these will be tiny hairs that you might find coating the surface of the organism. There would be lots of these, so hundreds of these cilia probably coating the surface. They provide movement of the entire cell. And then we can also have pseudopods, which are going to be projections. And those project projections, you can see them down here, um, are kind of like feet. The name pseudopodia, um, this means false feet. So these are going to be projections. They're constantly changing shape and they will allow the cell to actually move um, by changing its shape continuously. So that's how this um, protists are actually gonna move around. We can also talk about their reproduction modes. Um, some of them reproduce asexually. When we're talking about asexual reproduction, that is going to result in the production of clones. By saying that they are clones, that means that they will be genetically identical to each other. This process of um, asexual reproduction is really by mitosis, and mitosis produces identical cells. Just the normal, typical mitosis, we would call binary fission here. So that's what we see in this first picture. You have a nucleus inside of the parent cell. That nucleus is going to duplicate all of the information inside of it. So it's going to copy all of the chromosomes. And then once the nucleus is duplicated, we're also going to get a splitting of the cytoplasm. Specifically, we call that cytokinesis. And in the end, we get two daughter cells. So that's what we see right here. So these two daughter cells are identical to each other. So notice that one parent cell divided into two identical daughter cells. Another way that we can have asexual reproduction is going to be by budding. And that's what we see over here. In this case, the genetic information is gonna be copied and then it is actually going, the cell is going to kind of pinch off another piece so that it does end up producing um, a couple daughter cells from that original parent cell. Usually one of the cells is gonna stay large and you have a smaller one that kind of just buds off. And then we also have what we see down here at the bottom, which is called schizogony. And in this case, you have duplication or copying of the nucleus, and this is actually gonna be many times. So many mitosis events, so that you have one cell that has a bunch of nuclei inside of it, and then you will have cytokinesis, and that cytokinesis is going to produce a whole bunch of daughter cells all at once. Again, since mitosis was involved in this, these are gonna be daughter cells that are genetically identical to each other. So we can reproduce asexually, there are also going to be some protists that are gonna reproduce sexually. The advantage of sexual reproduction is going to be that we do have genetic variation when they reproduce that way. The genetic variation would come from the fact that you do have meiosis, and with the process of meiosis, you have things like crossing over and independent assortment, which will contribute to the genetic diversity. And then you also have a couple parents coming together and. Um, combining their DNA to give you a unique combination in the offspring. So a multitude of nutrient um, capabilities, we have different ways to move around, different modes of reproduction, and then we're also going to have different habitats that the protists can live in. Um, as far as habitats go, most are gonna be aquatic organisms. These are primarily going to be fresh water, but we do have some that are marine organisms. And then we also have some that are symbionts. 
And with symbionts, they can be in mutualistic relationships, they could be in parasitic relationships, and the parasitic part of it is a lot of what this class is about, is investigating the ones that are parasitic ones that um, are parasitic to plants. We also have some that are parasitic to a variety of animals, including human beings. In this picture right here, we're just seeing an example of a protist life cycle. Uh, many of our protists are going to actually have a couple different forms that they can take on. They might have a couple different habitats that they um, occupy throughout their entire life cycle. And in this case, we see that it does live in the intestinal tract of human beings. And we have this process called incestation down here. Um, and incestation is something that a lot of different protists are going to be capable of doing. This is going to be when the cell develops this very protective cell wall around it. And we call that a cyst. And that cyst is going to be resistant to a variety of different things in the environment. So these cysts um, can survive outside of a host. They can survive for a long period of time, sometimes um, weeks, months, could be even years, depending on the protists that we're looking at. And then later on, that cyst is going to um, go through this process called existation, where it actually exits that stage and is now gonna be really active again. So the cyst part is kind of a dormant stage and then existation is going to allow it to become active. Here we have another look at the protist diversity. We're going to go through and talk about just some of the protists that we see here, um, really just the ones that have the greatest significance to us as humans in the field of microbiology. We're going to start off with the amoebazoa group, which is going to be this group right down here, shown in blue, and talk about its characteristics. Amoebazoas would be considered protozoan, so they are animal-like protists. Um, these are going to be characterized by having this kind of irregular shape that has a lot of what we would call pseudopodia, which I'm drawing right here. You can also see it in the image here. So these projections are pseudopodia. Um, these are going to be really good at wrapping around and engulfing um, different food sources. They're also going to be very good at helping the organism to actually move around. So these will definitely be modal. When we're talking about the amoebozoa, they are going to be unicellular. So that means that they're made up of just one cell and they're mostly heterotrophic. The heterotrophic part of it, we are seeing part of it in the slide right here. Um, it is going to eat in many cases by this process called phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is this wrapping around of the pseudopods around a food source. So here we have a little cell. This is gonna be the food. And notice how the amoeba that we have here is taking its pseudopods and it's wrapping around and actually engulfing that cell so that it's going to bring it entirely inside of itself and then at that point it can digest it and obtain the nutrients from it. That would be the typical way that the um, organisms in the amoebozoa group are going to be feeding. Now we have um, the typical amoebas and then we also have what are called the slime molds. And the slime molds um, are very unique structures. Um, we have what are called plasmodial slime molds and then also cellular slime molds. And overall, they have a morphology, a shape, an appearance that's very similar to fungi. And one of the reasons why we think that they have this overall appearance that's very similar to fungi is because of the process of convergent evolution. Convergent evolution basically states that when organisms are fulfilling the same ecological roles, so they um, are taking on the same food sources, living in the same type of environments, that over time they begin to look very similar because that is a morphology or a shape that is very effective in that particular niche. So fungi are gonna be really similar to these in the fact that they do also obtain nutrients from their environment they are going to have a big surface area so that they can obtain their nutrients. And again, that's what we're seeing here. With the slime molds, they do use pseudopodia to move and feed. That's one reason why they're grouped in this category. And that um, the large surface area that we're gonna see in them is going to help maximize the exposure to their food sources so that they'll be able to absorb more nutrients. They do have very, very complex life cycles. Um, they're different from each other because one has more of a cellular structure. One of them is more just a mass of cytoplasm. 
So if we take a look at these a little more um, closely, individually, the plasmodial slime molds are usually very brightly colored. Um, if you go out in the woods and you turn over a rock, you might see um, a plasmodial slime mold on the underside of that. So they have kind of a web-like appearance like we see down here at the bottom. They are brightly orange, brightly yellow. And what we're looking at when we see that is the plasmodium. So that's what we call the feeding stage of the plasmodial slime molds. This plasmodium is really just a mass of cytoplasm that does not have divisions. So that mass of cytoplasm is going to be multinucleate. That means it's gonna have lots of nuclei that are all right there together. And so these will be produced by mitosis, but you don't have the cytokinesis that's gonna divide that mass into separate individual cells. So they're all kind of working together as a colony. Um, they do feed by phagocytosis and the different nuclei that we see in there, they are going to be diploid, which means they have two sets of chromosomes. Now, if we were to look at the overall life cycle, just to emphasize the fact that these um, have this plasmodium that is multinucleate, um, right here we can see that multinucleated plasmodium. Notice how it does have many nuclei in the same cytoplasm. So they're not divided from each other by um, a plasma membrane, anything like that. They actually work together so that they can spread out and cover a large area for feeding and absorbing nutrients. And then later on, they work together to actually build this stalk that we see over here, which is going to help them with their reproduction process. So they do produce spores um, which they want to raise up on a stalk and then release into the environment. So that's the um, plasmodial slime mold. It does have um, mitosis, which produces a bunch of nuclei, but then they're gonna stay there in the same mass of cytoplasm. If we look at the cellular slime molds, the cellular slime molds um, are similar because they will have um, that structure that looks like fungi. Under ideal conditions, they do have cells that maintain their individual identities. So what this means is that each nuclei is going to be inside of its own cellular structure, so its own plasma membrane around the outside. And then when conditions become very harsh or when there's not many nutrients available, the cells are going to combine together and work together to survive. With these, the main stage is going to be haploid. So that means that most of the nuclei that we do see there, they are going to be haploid and only have one set of chromosomes. So that is a major distinguishing characteristic between the plasmodial slime molds and the cellular slime molds. Plasmodial are primarily diploid, the cellular primarily haploid. Now, if we look at the life cycle of the cellular slime molds, um, you can see that we do have the cells actually divided. So these are not gonna be a mass of nuclei altogether. They're actually divided. Notice that down here um, towards the bottom, you can see that you have individual cells, but they're going to collect together, aggregate together when conditions become rough. So when nutrients are limiting, so there's not much food, then they begin to work together. Um, when they're individual, they do have an amoeba-like appearance with the pseudopods, which again is one of the reasons why we group them into this amoebozoa category.